All right, so we're going to begin in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse number 4. I know this is what is known as a minor prophets, and if you uh, blink while you're flipping through the back half of the Old, uh, the Old Testament there, you might pass it, so I'll give you a second to find it. And uh, Habakkuk chapter 2, uh, we've been preaching a series through the book of Habakkuk. I uh, haven't really announced that or anything, but that's basically what it's become. And we dealt with uh, Habakkuk's prayers last week, some lessons from Habakkuk's prayer life. And before that, we dealt with uh, the judgment of nations. Now we're dealing with that again um, in Habakkuk chapter 2. I want to begin reading in verse number 5. The Bible says, well, actually, let's go back to verse 4. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Yea, also, because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desire as hell, and is as death, and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him as all people. Shall not all these take up a parable against him, and a taunting proverb against him, and say, Woe to him that increaseth that which is not his? How long? And to him that ladeth himself with thick clay, shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee, and awake that thou that shalt vex thee, and thou shalt be for booties unto them? Because thou hast spoiled many nations, all the remnant of the people shall spoil thee, because of men's blood and for the violence of the land, of the city, and of all that dwell therein. And we'll stop right there. For our morning service, uh, we'll be dealing with these verses here and uh, taking some applications for ourselves. In Habakkuk chapter 1, Habakkuk is praying. He's found in the very beginning, and he's telling God about the wickedness of his own nation. He's praying to God and saying, how long? He says, how long are you going to allow this to go on? And God answers and says that judgment is coming from the north. The Babylonians are coming, and it's not going to be pretty. Uh, He basically goes through and tells about how they are a terrible, terrible and violent nation, and they're going to come down and destroy them. And Habakkuk, of course, uh, seeing this answer, not really liking it, he wanted God to deal with the situation, but that's not how he wanted it done. Of course, uh, the thought of Babylon, I believe, probably struck fear into the heart of Habakkuk and into the heart of uh, the nation of Judah. Uh, because of that, I'm sure the stories had come about how they were conquering all the nations around them. And his complaint in chapter uh, 1, verse 13 says, uh, Art thou art of pure eyes, and to behold evil, and canst thou, thou look upon iniquity? Therefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? And he basically says, hey, they're worse than us. How could they judge us. How can they come in? How can you use them when they're worse than us? And of course, in chapter two, verse one, we see that Habakkuk's prayer is, as he's asking this to God, while it seems presumptuous, while it seems prideful, maybe a little bit, it's not because he actually, uh, the Bible tells us he did his prayer right. Uh, The Bible tells us that he waited for the Lord's answer. He was asking a sincere question, and it was also a humble question as he was willing to be uh, reproved to the Lord. And every time we come to the Lord, we ought to be willing to be reproved, that he would correct our attitude and our motives and all of that. In Habakkuk 2, 1, it says, And I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower, and I will watch to see what he shall say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. So God's answer was very simple. He came back to him and he said, listen, uh, the just shall live by his faith, faith, excuse me, his faith. And so the answer was have faith in God. And God is working on a higher level. He's working on a level that we can't not even comprehend. And of course, God is predicting about to predict the, the complete and total devastation of the nation of Babylon. But he's also in this case, he's just he's uh, prophesying a 70 year desolation of the nation of Judah as they go into captivity and eventually return. But God is working on a higher level and we can't understand his ways. We don't know how things are going to work out. We just have to live by faith. And so God continues his reply and he makes it clear that Babylon is not, it's not going to avoid judgment, but God is going to use Babylon to judge the nation of Judah. 
And that's where we're coming to today. In verse number six, the Bible has a, a, a particular phrase that we're going to be taking up for our morning sermon, where it says, woe to him that increases that which is not his. And that's what I'd like to, to make a mention of today and talk about. Uh, we're going to be dealing with the sin of stealing, and I will be dealing with this uh, personally and nationally and so forth. And so uh, we'll get into this in just a moment, but I think at this time we should have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd help me as I preach. I pray, Lord, that this would be clear and plain as you have laid this out. Lord, it's commanded in your word to preach the word. Lord, and to reprove and rebuke and exhort uh, with all uh, long suffering and doctrine. And Lord, I just pray that, that that would be the way this is received and it's, as it's given today. And Lord, I pray that you'd fill me with your spirit, Lord. I need your help today. And I pray uh, that if there's some area that we can get right in, in this from this sermon, I pray that we would, uh, Lord, humble ourselves in, in these areas. Lord, and help us to, to learn some things and grow as Christians as a result of the services today. We love you and thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So God is letting Habakkuk know that Babylon uh, is going to get theirs eventually. God is about to list out the reasons why he's going to destroy Babylon one day. And boy, it is going to be an epic failure, epic collapse, if you will. And this study, I believe, is not just going is, is going to help us. Um, because these things hold true to our personal lives as well. Uh, God hasn't stopped dealing with nations, and so I think we should be careful to look at our nation and, of course, the nations of the world, but also uh, ourselves personally. Uh, we find a, a passage, several uh, promises in the Bible, statements of fact in the Bible. In Psalms 33, verse 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Uh, if we nationally turn to God, the Bible says that brings blessings. And in Psalms 9, 17, the Bible says, the wicked shall be turned into hell and the nations that forget God. And so today I'll say to this, we'll say, woe to Babylon. And we'll say, woe to America, woe to the nations of this earth that commit these types of sins. And uh, may we remember the fall of Babylon and the judgment of God and be afraid of that. In our own lives. In this chapter here, we find five times that in this chapter that God issues a woe against Babylon. Now, the word woe, if you look it up in the dictionary, is, is a calamity, a misery, a sorrow, grief, uh, a curse, or judgment. So he's he is predicting, he is prophesying impending judgment from uh, the sins that they are doing. And often, I've mentioned this before, sins will have a built-in woe to them, a built-in calamity. Uh, and the Bible teaches this over and over again. People that, that commit certain sins will often uh, be caught in their own sins, and th that sin will have its own judgment attached to it. And I'm not going to give you all those type of examples today, but it's true. It's the absolute truth. And uh, many times, you know, societies will self-destruct, and God doesn't even have to lift the finger. Uh, because of just the wickedness and the sin as we throw off God's ways, as we throw off the family unit, as we throw off, uh, you know, uh, standards of decency and honesty and integrity and so forth. Uh, guess what happens? Uh, we are destroyed in that way. And so while God deal, certainly pronounces woe unto nations, he says this five times to them, uh, woe uh, unto them. Uh, but nation and but nations are made up of individuals. And I think it would behoove us to examine ourselves. And as we hear these woes, I think, listen, we should think about ourselves. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one, 31, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Now, that context is about the Lord's Supper. But in reality, that is a just a Bible principle. Because the Bible also teaches if we'll confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What does that mean? Why does he say that? That's not confessing your sins to be saved. You just confess Jesus Christ to be saved. But as a Christian, if you confess your sins, meaning that you admit the guilt, I confess to doing such and such, and admitting to God that it's wrong, if you'll judge yourself, he's faithful and just to cleanse you of that sin, and you will uh, and deal with the unrighteousness. He'll deal with the guilt and all of that associated with that sin. If we'll confess it, 
He will help us, and, and we may even uh, stave off some of the chastisement or all of the chastisement we would have gotten, uh, the woes, per se, that we would have gotten had we not confessed it, had we not admitted it, had we not um, you know, judged ourselves, so to speak. And Job said this in Job chapter 10, verse 15, if I be wicked, woe unto me. And if I be righteous, yet will I not lift up my head? I am full of confusion, for thou uh, therefore shall uh, see mine affliction. And I believe Job, of course, was ultimately, he was a righteous man. The Bible tells us that he was perfect and upright. He had a right heart motive. He feared God and eschewed evil, the Bible says. But, you know, he he was uh, a man of the fear, full of the fear of God. And he said, woe unto me. Woe unto me if I be not and uh, if I be wicked, woe unto me. And that's how we need to, to look at this. Uh, honestly, um, as Job was going through a terrible calamity in his life, he stopped to think. He said, Well, wait a minute, H have I done right? Search me, O God, and see if there be any wicked way in me. Uh, try my heart, David said. And so this is how we should approach things in our life because sin is deceptive. Uh, all of these things that we're going to be dealing with today, they're deceptive. Often uh, we don't set out to sin, but something leads us to that sin and we justify it in our minds. And we've got to be very careful about that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, the Bible says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. So individuals can have woe upon them and calamity upon them. And I believe that we are responsible for the truth that's been presented to us. It's a dangerous thing to go to church. It's a dangerous thing to read your Bible, but it's also a dangerous thing not to go to church, not to read your Bible, not to know the truth, right? Because there's woes both ways, right? Once you, you are responsible for that, you're responsible to God for the truth that's laid out before you. So I say, hey, woe to Babylon, woe to America, and woe to me. You know, if I go down these paths. So that's that's basically what I want to talk about today. So often we feel like Habakkuk in the midst of this world. We see a lot of sin around us. And he said, of course, in verse two of chapter one, how long, O Lord, uh, how long shall I cry? He says, oh, Lord, how long shall I cry? And thou wilt not hear even cry out unto thee of violence and thou wilt not save. And so, you know, how often we feel like God needs to do something. He needs to step in and deal with things. And we've talked about this before, but first of all, uh, God does see and God does hear. And then we also need to understand that it's going to be in his time and it's going to be in his way that he makes these things right. And so the answer, of course, is that we need to live by faith and make sure that you and I are right with God. Uh, we can't fix America, but we can fix our house. We can fix our home. We can fix our church, you know, by fixing us, right? And uh, encouraging and provoking one another to righteousness, as the Bible tells us. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, the Bible says that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. So we need to be like Habakkuk, shining as lights in the world. We need to, to be in the lights in the midst of the crooked and perverse nation. Now, God is going to show uh, how God's light and his goodness and his righteousness, it compares to the darkness and the wickedness that's in the nation of Babylon. And this, this wickedness and this, the sins that are laid out there, they are darkness. There's a path of darkness and wickedness, and there's a lot of wickedness in this world today. Now, let's take a look at Habakkuk chapter 2. There are five woes listed, five calamities, five judgments, five uh, ways that that uh, things that God is saying that is going to ultimately be the destruction and downfall of the nation of Babylon. And woe is unto us if we don't pay heed and attention to this. I think we can apply this to many nations in the world today. And, and the United States of America absolutely fits the bill with many of these things today. Uh, first thing that we see is in verse number six, he says, woe to him that increaseth uh, that which is not his. Getting things that aren't yours. Hey, that's not yours. That is that is wrong. That's a major woe. Woe to him. That increases that which is not his. And then woe in verse number nine, woe to him that coveteth and evil covetousness 
to his house. So this deals with the, the core of the problem, uh, this idea of, of wanting things that you shouldn't want or wanting things that are not yours uh, in, in this lustful way. And then at verse 12, the Bible says, Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood and establisheth a city by iniquity. Woe and calamity, judgment upon them. And then verse 15, Woe to him that giveth his neighbor to drink. Woe to him. That give it his neighbor to drink. We'll talk about that later. And he says in verse number 19, Woe to him that saith to the wood, Awake, and to the dumb stone, Arise. The nations that have idolatry uh, and are worshiping these, these idols are wicked, and there is going to be judgment for that. And so for these reasons, God is going to judge Babylon and bring calamity, bring judgment, bring woe unto them. And so how many times, by the way, have we looked at situations and said, hey, how long? You know, how long, Lord? And we've worried about the how and the when. God is going to step in and take care of some problem for us. But my answer is this. You know, his, God's answer is the just shall live by faith. Take it to the Lord. Trust him. But what we have here is a universal principle taking place that God is going to teach them. And I believe this is to be true. Turn to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Now, ultimately, God brings in a judgment upon them. But here's the thing. As you're going to see, uh, the judgment came to them because of their treatment of others and how they dealt with people. And uh, the, the woe was built into the sin. The woe was built into the sin. The, the, the sure calamity was built in to the sin. Here's the universal principle found in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If you take uh, the seeds of these sins and plant them in the ground, you're not going to come out, they're not going to come out with righteousness and holiness and godliness and purity and love and the fruits of the spirit. It's just not going to happen. Uh, God has built this into it. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Now, what are we talking about? Well, you know, when we sow to the flesh, we're going to reap, we're going to do the sins of the flesh. And the sins of the flesh uh, are listed out in Galatians chapter 5. It's in context. And these sins are uh, just all of the wicked sins that people do in the flesh. But the fruits of the Spirit, if you sow in the Spirit, you're going to reap these things that will provide eternal rewards in heaven. We're talking about the fruits of the Spirit, like love and joy and peace and long-suffering and so forth. That's going to reap benefits in your life that are that go long beyond this life here. But the benefits here in this life are a blessing too. I mean, how many of you would like to have the fruits of the Spirit in your life, the love and joy and peace and long-suffering, gentleness and holiness and all of these things? But we need to understand, God's not mocked. What you sow, you're going to reap. And so are we sowing to the flesh? Are we doing the works of the flesh? In Galatians chapter 5, he tells us what the works of the, uh, the works of the flesh are. Let's turn over there, Galatians chapter 5. In context, talking about this, I wanted to just go ahead and show you this verse. I thought about it and thought about it again, decided to do that. The Bible says here in... Uh, Verse number 16, this I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So the answer to this is to walk in the spirit. And he says this, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit are against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. And then he goes on and says the works in verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, and heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Now we'll jump down to verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Verse number 25, for if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So the answer to this is to walk in the Spirit. Instead of the flesh, walk in the Spirit. You'll, you'll have these 
wonderful things in your life, peace and long suffering and meekness and temperance, right? Control of your, of your lust and your emotions and all of this. And then the Bible says, if you walk in the flesh, you are going to reap corruption. It is built in. And we know this, don't we? We, how many people, you look at this list, you say adultery, how many people have committed adultery and then got killed by the person who they, they cheated on? You know, uh, fornication. How many how many times uh, ha- has there been diseases and uh, just filth has been picked up through the act of this wicked act of fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness and on and on and on. There is a judgment. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now, is this our job to bring about uh, the, the justice and judgment on people that we see? Is this our job? No, all we can do is just say what the Bible says. This is above our pay grade, but he will take care of these issues. He will take care of these issues. And he tells us how to live in Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. In Romans 12, 20, it says, therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, ye shall heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So the judgment's coming. The woe is under these folks, but it's not our job. It's not our job to take them down and uh, all of that kind of stuff and bring vengeance upon them. It's God's, and he will do it. We just, if we, we just need to be good. Overcome evil with good. Now, Galatians chapter 6 goes on and says in verse 9, but let us not be weary in well-doing, but for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. That is, therefore, we therefore have opportunity. Let us do good unto all men, especially of them that are the household of faith. So we understand this principle that God is not mocked, that there is a sowing and reaping. If if you reap to the flesh, you're going to reap. Whoa, that's what he's talking about. Corruption, death, uh, condemnation. You're going to reap woe. But if you sow to the spirit, there's going to be blessings and all of that. So so it's it's uh, I want to just go back to Habakkuk now. And I want to also just say this as we get into this this first woe. It's not really what we have that matters. It's what we do with it's really how we got it is what matters. Right. And, you know, we. um you know, I just want to kind of bring this up here as we look at this first woe in verse number six. Nebuchadnezzar is the king that we think of when we think about the Babylonian Empire. He was there for 63 years, I believe it was, and he uh, was just famous, infamous, right? I mean, he's just, you know, he was the man that, that was there when, when it was an ancient wonder of the world. And the might of Babylon... Um, you know, was known all over the world, you know, all over the known world at the time. And, you know, this king, Nebuchadnezzar, thought he was the greatest king who ever lived, right? And God brought him down. He humbled him and made him eat grass like a like an animal. And so I want to just remind you that even the mightiest nations fall. Even the mightiest nations fall if they uh, participate in the sins that are listed out in this chapter. Woe to him. Woe to him. So let's look at these five woes of God upon Babylon. We'll deal with probably one one this morning. But the Bible says, woe it to him, in verse number six, that increaseth that which is not his. Now, primarily, this is a woe uh, unto the nation itself. But again, nations are made up of individuals. This is very clearly a uh, God is saying that there is a judgment upon those who would steal and rob. Taking something that's not yours. Notice the phrase, that which is not his. The question is, is that yours? Is that rightfully yours? A preacher preached a sermon that I I heard preached. It was the craziest thing I ever heard, where he said private property is not a biblical concept, and we need to go to a communist, basically, form of government and not own anything and all of that. Just this weird sermon that I heard. Uh, I I couldn't disagree more. God wants us to own things, but here's the thing. God wants us to get the things that we own honestly. 
And then he wants us not to be owned by those things and through covetousness, right? Because some people, you know, they just love the things. But God wants us to have our own piece of land and our own, uh, you know, property, car, and all of that kind of thing. But it's important how we get them, that we get them honestly. In Exodus chapter 20, the eighth commandment says, Thou shalt not steal. In Exodus 20, 15. Thou shalt not steal. Could is that any? Uh, could that be any clear? Stealing is a sin. Taking personal property, possessions, money that doesn't belong to you is a sin. It shouldn't be uh, a hard one to amen to, right? This is pretty clear in the Bible. Uh, sin doesn't matter. It does the size doesn't matter, does it? Size doesn't matter. The amount doesn't matter. There was a scam years ago where these guys came up with this idea. And I can't remember exactly how it worked, but they basically stole a few pennies out of like millions of bank accounts or something like that. And uh, anybody know that story? <laughs> heard, at least heard of it. Anybody? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. OK. Amen. And uh, so, you know, hey, didn't really hurt anybody. People didn't even notice. I mean, let's be honest. How many of you, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, would notice a few pennies missing out of your bank account? Now, there's a few of you who probably would go at the end of the month and justify it and be like, hey, what's going on here? I'm missing a few pennies, but a lot of us would not really catch it. <laughs> yeah, mom, maybe <laughs> she would know. But uh, you could get over on me pretty easy with that. Um, but, you know, that, that doesn't make it less of a sin. Doesn't make it less of a sin, does it? God says thou shalt not steal. He doesn't say thou shalt not steal unless they deserve it. He doesn't say thou shalt not steal unless it's just a small amount underneath, you know, uh, this amount. And then it's a misdemeanor or then it doesn't even count or whatever. He just says thou shalt not steal. By the way, I want to give you that leave give you this thought this morning. Why would a Christian steal? You know, Christians don't need to steal. Nobody, nobody needs to steal, right? But, uh, you know, Christians especially, what, what, is the, what is the issue? Why would a Christian steal? Well, let me put it in the positive. A Christian doesn't need to steal. You know why? Number one, Matthew 6, the Bible says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. A dedicated Christian doesn't need to steal because God promises to provide those who put him first, seek him first. God promises to provide. You don't need to steal. Turn over to Malachi chapter 3. God promises to provide for those who seek him first and put him first and his work first. But not only that, God promises to provide for those who tithe to their local church. You don't need to steal. Matthew chapter 3 verse 10 says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. Now, the Bible tells us very clearly in the New Testament that the church is the house of God. It says it very clearly. And he says, Prove me there herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So God says, Prove it. Prove me. He says, You don't need, God's going to bless you if you give to the local church, if you seek the Lord first, if you do these things. God's going to bless you. Not only that, but He's going to give you enough. Uh, he said, Open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. That's, that's, and there shall not be room enough to receive it. Amen. And then He says, Not only that, but He says, And I will rebuke the, the, the devourer for your sakes, and He shall not destroy the fruit of your ground. He's going to rebuke. All of these pests and all of this stuff. Boy, I need to, you know, we all need to make sure we tie. If you got a garden, man, there's some pests around here. These uh, little beetles and all kinds of stuff. Make sure you give your tithes so the, the, the devourers don't come. Locusts don't come. All that stuff don't come. Amen. And he says, uh, neither shall your rot vine cast her fruit before time. Rot on the vine and all of that, saith the Lord of hosts. God is going to bless. Look, a Christian doesn't have to steal if they're, uh, if they're seeking the kingdom first. A Christian doesn't have to steal it if they're uh, tithing to their local church. And, of course, you know, it's interesting. Look back at verse 8 in that chapter, Malachi 3, 8. The Bible says not tithing is robbing God. So, uh, you know, you don't need to steal from the Lord by not tithing. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 says, Will a man rob God? You have, have yet, uh, yet you have robbed me, but you say herein have we robbed God in tithes and offerings. 
He said, and ye are cursed with a fire, uh, for ye have robbed me, even this, this whole nation. So here he's basically saying, woe unto this nation who's not tithing, not giving the money uh, to the storehouses, to the church, to the house of God. New Testament, we have a house of God and a high priest called Melchizedek, and um, we, we tied to him. Now, let me give you one more here. Another reason Christians don't need to steal and shouldn't steal. I was thinking about this. Um, Proverbs 22, 9 says, He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he uh, giveth his bread to the poor. You know, a dedicated Christian doesn't need to steal uh, if he's, you know, a giving person. If, they're, if they are a giving person, helping in times of need, you know, being a blessing to other people and so forth. God promises to provide for giving people, giving people, helping other people. And then, of course, turn over to Proverbs chapter 28. Uh, a dedicated Christian just doesn't need to steal, doesn't need to steal. Why? Proverbs 28, 19 says, He that tilleth his land shall have plenty of bread, but he that followeth after vain persons shall have poverty enough. A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. Listen, God promises uh, to provide for hardworking people. You know, you don't need to steal because God's going to bless your hard work. You, you know, you don't Christians don't need to steal because God is promising to bless hardworking people. Proverbs 20, 13 says, love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. He's given a principle. If you work hard, you're going to have plenty. You're going to have your bread. You're going to have the needs met and so forth. So a dedicated Christian doesn't need to steal. So you have to ask, why are people tempted to steal? Why are people drawn to this? Why is it in all of our hearts to take something that isn't ours? What is the root of this sin? What is the root? Well, as uh, I think uh, my dad just, I heard him kind of whisper it over there. It was a lack of faith, right? Is that what you said? I heard you saying that to mom. It's exactly right. That's a root. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. Why do people to you know go to uh, steal? Well, sometimes they just don't trust God. They think that God's not going uh, to provide for them. They don't see how God's going to provide for them. And they're like, how long? How long? Where are you at, God? Hey, have faith in God is the answer. But there are other roots of this sin. And uh, there are other wicked motives to at play here. And we're going to look at this real quick this morning. In Habakkuk chapter 2, I want to go to verse number 5, because now he's talked about, uh, you know, the just shall live by faith in verse 4, and now he's going to verse 5, and he gives us some problems with Babylon, and he's leading up to this first woe uh, and judgment upon them. And the first thing he brings out is in verse 5, and he says, Yea, also, because he transgresseth by wine. So he's telling us where that this is the part of the root of the problem. The fruit is corrupt. The fruit is, uh, cor the Bible says their, their fruit is cor corruption, right? Um, the Bible tells us uh, to, to sow, not to sow to the flesh, and that otherwise that brings corruption. And so here we have it. The Bible tells us the first root that leads here to this idea of stealing and taking something that's not yours uh, actually is quite possibly brought on by their transgression by wine, drinking liquor. It's root sins that lead to stealing. Now, you know, it's, it's interesting, um, but, you know, when, uh, when people like to get together and organize uh, their crimes and stuff, where, where do they get together? Do they go to church? Do they fellowship together at church and they're organized? Hopefully not. Maybe some of these churches. But um, a, lo a, lot of, a lot of wicked business deals going down at bars, nightclubs, uh, casinos, strip clubs, a lot of sin being dealt with, uh, talked about and hatched and uh, planned and stuff. And so the Bible says, yea, also because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desires hell and is as death and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him nations and heapeth unto him all people. And then colon there, shall not all these take up a parable against him and a taunting proverb and say unto him, uh, say against him, and say, woe to him that increaseth that which is not his. So we see that there is a, a lead up to this, this uh, woe. And the first one that we see here is this idea of drinking liquor. You say, well, how is this, uh, how does drinking liquor tied to robbery and so forth? Well, I would say that there's no doubt 
that the, the Babylonians' use of liquor and alcohol was part of their problem. Now, drinking wine is a transgression. It is a sin, the Bible says, but also drinking wine will cause you to go into other transgressions, to go into other sins. So it's a sin, but it's also a root sin that leads to other sins. And so we find this in Proverbs chapter 23. Let's flip back there. And I want you to look at Proverbs chapter 23. And I want you to see that the use of alcohol uh, leads to other sins. What led to this? Uh, this mentality, this wicked society that is stealing property and land and has built their whole nation upon uh, thievery. What is it? Well, the Bible says in Proverbs 23, 29, who hath woe? Well, that's an interesting word. Who hath calamity and judgment and, and all of this, uh, problems and so on? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause who had who hath redness of eyes he's describing now uh the the problems that come up from people who drink alcohol verse 30 they that tarry long at the wine and they that go to seek mixed wine and he gives a command now they'll somebody will say well hey wait a minute i that means you just shouldn't tarry too long well no that's not what it says it says look not thou upon the wine when it is red when it giveth its color in the cup and when it moveth itself aright so this fermented beverage that can get you drunk the bible says not to even look upon it not to even look upon it at the last it biteth like a, a serpent and it stingeth like an adder be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. How many times have we seen people reap judgment, reap problems because of their use of alcohol? And notice this. It leads to other sins in verse 33. It says, thine eyes shall behold, uh, thine eyes shall behold strange women. So now it's leading you down a path towards Fornication, strange flesh is flesh that you are not supposed to know physically. That's that's a stranger. That's not your possession and marriage and so forth. And so thine eyes shall behold strange women. It's going to cause you to lust and thine heart shall utter perverse things. If you drink alcohol and you use alcohol here in this way, yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth on the midst of. Uh, down in the midst of the sea, or he that lieth on the top of a mast, they have stricken me, thou shalt say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. And when I, shall I when shall I awake? And I will seek it yet again. Now we see this is uh, these chain train, chain drinkers who are constantly going back to the bottle. Uh, you know, just even in the morning they're drinking, in the afternoon they're drinking, they're at the club at night, and all of this, and it's a, a path of destruction. But you see clearly that th this sin leads to other sins. Bible tells us that in Proverbs 20, verse 1, that drinking wine will impair our judgment and cause us to sin. There's a sign, they, they had a big campaign years ago called Drink Responsibly, put signs up all over the town. That's That's kind of ridiculous, isn't it? You know, because the moment you start drinking, it impairs your judgment and causes you to sin. Bible says in Proverbs 21, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Of course, there's a deception involved. People feel like uh, the alcohol is going to bring them uh, help dealing with their problems, but it does nothing but compound their problems. You know, you've heard of this before, you know, like I'm feeling down I'm feeling rough. I'm feeling sad. Things aren't going my way. So in a lack of faith, they go to the club and they or they go to the bar, they go to the pub or whatever it is, and they begin to drink away their misery. And to that, that to that point, they will compound their misery and it will cause them to go into more sins and more sins. And there's no doubt that the sin of drinking led them, this nation, their sin of using the bottle, that wicked liquor uh, had led them to the sin of stealing. The Bible says it. It goes on to say, I want to point out the next root sin. What was the, uh, in this this woe here? We'll deal with more on this woe, uh, this, this judgment. Uh, on the fourth woe, when he talks about um, just the wicked fruit of, uh, the wicked destruction of drinking alcohol. And there are some amazing stories about things that happen to people, horrible things that happen to people when they drank alcohol, horrible sins, horrible sins, incest and all kinds of things. So root sins that lead to stealing, number one, that's, that's 
told here uh, to this first woe is the, the use of alcohol, the use of alcohol. Number two, we see uh, in there in verse five, he is a proud man. Now, pride is a major sin that leads to other other sins. And certainly it led to the sin of theft. I believe that. Now you say, well, how does that, what's the process where pride would lead to theft, right? Well, there, I, I think it could come uh, to this in a few different ways, but let me just get, before I get to that, let me uh, tell you what pride does. It's a, it's a root sin. Pride will cause you to not seek after God. The Bible says in Psalms 1, uh, 10 verse 4, the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. There's a way that a person could go down a path into uh, stealing and, and bring woe in their life is through this sin of pride because the pride of the countenance, a man will not seek God. When you're not seeking God and his ways and living in the fear of God, then you're looking, you're living by the lust of the flesh and you're going after, you can go after sin like that. And uh, so pride will also uh, cause you to treat other people wrongly. Pride will cause you to treat people in a despicable way. Psalms 10 verse 2 says the wicked in his pride does persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. A prideful person sees themselves as better than everyone else. And, of course, the Bible tells us not to esteem ourselves higher than we ought to think. But a prideful person uh, will treat people in the wrong way because, you know, they're, they're better than them in their minds. And you'll see this done. They, they'll look at people, and I, I, don't, I think they'll even steal from them because, you know, they deserve it. I'm better than they are, you know. It, pride leads to this, to leads people to treat peop, other people wrongly. The wicked in his pride that persecute the poor. You know, in Proverbs 13, 10, the Bible says, only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Did you know pride is a root sin of wars and fighting and contention, arguing, bickering, and all of that kind of stuff? Pride will lead to that. Only pride, pride cometh contention. And of course, the pride of Babylon uh, caused them to, instead of working with other cities around them, instead of being diplo diplomatic and uh, all of that, no, they just said, you know what? Hey, that's I want that piece of property, and I want that piece of property. I want that city. I want that country. And they said, oh, you know, hey, all of a sudden they had an idea. Let's go take uh, Israel. Let's go take Judah. That looks like a nice piece of real estate, right? Let's go down there. Nothing but pride. Only by pride cometh contention. Babylon went to war and conquered the other nations around him. And you'll see in this passage that God was totally against this imperialistic mindset, this conquering other nations and going to war. The Bible says in uh, you know Proverbs 29, 23, a man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Of course, pride will ultimately bring destruction. It always does. It's a promise. It's a principle. It's a, it's a built-in woe. People that are prideful will end up in destruction. A man's pride shall bring him low. Proverbs 18, 16, 18 says, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And this is ultimately what God used to bring down Babylon. It was what brought down Babylon was their pride. Turn to Daniel chapter five. I want you to see this. Now, as we lead into this story, uh, of the second king uh, uh, after the, the king after Nebuchadnezzar, um, you'll see, you remember, if you will, the pride of Nebuchadnezzar who built up this giant image and caused everyone to worship it. And everyone had to, whenever he played his music, how prideful is it when the, the, the demagogue, the, the, this, this all powerful totalitarian leader says, I'm going to play music. And whenever you hear the music, you start bowing down and worshiping, you know, how, how wicked is that? And, of course, we've got prideful government officials that, that play the music and want us to dance to their fiddle, too. And uh, that's wicked as well, but it's pride. It's pride. And now Nebuchadnezzar was brought low, as the Bible says, and made to eat of the grass of the field like an animal. God took his mind from him, and then his pride, and it, his it, he's now he's dead and gone, and his son uh, Belsh uh, Belshazzar is now in, in charge and he, he takes up right where his father left off and he didn't learn from his father, but he repeated his father's mistake and 
ultimately brought the end to the Babylonian Empire as the Bible predicted uh, in Habakkuk chapter 2. Uh, the Bible says that they would the, the spoiler would become spoiled. And uh, that is exactly what happened when the Me uh, Medo-Persian Empire came in and just destroyed them. So the root sin is pride. The Bible says the root sin was drinking and so on. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 5, verse 17, and then Daniel answered and said before the king, let thy gifts be to thyself and, and give that thy reward to another. And I yet I will read the writing unto the king and make known to him the interpretation. Now we're picking up right in the middle of the story for a lack of time this morning. But if you remember, uh, Belshazzar has now commanded uh, a, a big party. He's got all of the instruments uh, from the uh, that the, the golden cups and everything from that they had taken from uh, Judah in the temple back before it was destroyed and had stolen them and brought them into his house and Nebuchadnezzar did and now he brought them out and they're having a big drunken party uh, they're having a wild party and all of a sudden as he's sitting there a hand comes out on the wall just a hand just a hand not special effects there's like a hand that comes out and starts writing on the wall and uh, he says what in the world language is that nobody knew all the kings astrologers and all of them couldn't understand the language and so they said hey somebody get daniel so daniel's about to tell him what's going on why he's seeing that hand and he says in verse number 18 oh thou king the most high god had i gave nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor so god gave him this Ability And for the majesty that he gave them, all peoples, nations, and language trembled and feared before him, whom he would slew and whom he would keep alive, uh, would, would he kept alive, excuse me, and whom he would set up and whom he would he put down. But when his heart was lifted up in pride and his mind hardened in pride, notice that, that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Mind hardened in pride. Pride will harden your mind, harden your heart. He was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like uh, the beasts, and the dwellings uh, was his dwelling was with the wild asses, and they fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until, until he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointed over it whomsoever he will. So again, ultimately, uh, this ties in with Habakkuk because God has promised that he's going to judge this nation of Babylon. And this is ultimately the judgment here recorded for us in Daniel chapter five. And he, he says, you know what? God is in control. God took his mind from him. And then he says this, and thou, his son, O Belshazzar, hath not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this. He says, you have no excuse, buddy. No excuse. You grew up. You saw your dad. You saw him proclaim. You saw him proclaim that there's one God. You were may, He may have even been there when there was a fourth man in the fire. and He saw all of these things go on. He might have seen some of this stuff. But he says, he, you knew all this, but thou hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee. And thou and the lords, uh, lords, thy wives and thy concubines, and have drunk wine in them. So this, of course, covers several of the woes already, doesn't it? From that God pronounced would be the downfall of Babylon. What did he, what do we see so far? Well, we we know that there's pride involved with this, but that's not the direct woe. But of course, um, the covetousness and the, the the stealing, right? The stolen vessels. Uh, what about the use of alcohol? As they're having a drinking party with the cups that were supposed to be used in the temple worship of Almighty God. But these were stolen vessels. They're stolen vessels. And these aren't just any vessels. It's not like, oh, man, they took my, you know, my cheap ceramic dish or whatever. Uh, no, th these are golden vessels. We know how much gold is, is valued at today. And he says he goes. Uh, and then, of course, they go on and it says, and then we see the next one. Thou hast praised the gods of silver and of gold and of brass and iron, wood and stone, which see not nor hear nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath is and whose are all thy ways hast thou not glorified. So, again, God is basically bringing to Belshazzar several of the woes 
that God already told would be the, the downfall and the destruction of Babylon when he told this to Habakkuk back in Habakkuk chapter 2. And judgment, by the way, was brought down. And so when he begins to read the, the words that were written on the wall, we see in verse 24, and then uh, was the part of the hand sent from him, and the writing was written. And this is the writing, verse 25, that was written, uh, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Farson. And this is the interpretation of the thing. Mene, God had numbered the king, thy kingdom and finished it. He's basically saying, hey, this is, it's over. The days are numbered. This is how many days there are left. God has already numbered it. He already numbered it in the book of Habakkuk. He says there's a time when Babylon is going to meet their ultimate demise. He says in verse number 27, Tekel, which is interpreted, thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. So remember, God judges nations. God deals with individuals. And for uh, the lost person, my friends, I must tell you that there is a day of judgment. The Bible says this to us today. The Bible says there is one death, right? The Bible tells us there is a second death. And after that death is judgment. The Bible tells us that there is judgment after you die. And there is going to be a time when the person who dies without Christ is going to stand before God and every sin is going to be brought before God and they shall be judged for their sins. Now, thank God there's a better way than that. Thank God every person is not going to be cast into hell for every sin they ever committed uh, that were recorded down by God. Thank God Jesus made a way of salvation. He took, he doesn't take when we go to heaven, when we get, go up there to make our way in, he doesn't take the balances and see if we're weighed in, in the balances and found uh, wanting or found, uh, it, you know, in, in the good, or I don't know how you'd say that. Uh, but, you know, he doesn't do that to let us in. You see, Jesus would be, you know, we go in on his account. So if he did put the scales, it would be our sins and it would be Jesus Christ and all his good works, that his good, uh, his sinless record that gets us into heaven. Uh, it is by his work on the cross and uh, it, he forgives us of our sins. But every man is going to stand before God one day. And he tells this man, Belshazzar, you are found, you've been weighed in the balance and found wanting. So, my friends, you can have your sins forgiven by believing on Jesus Christ. Or you can stand before God one day, and every person who hasn't had their sins forgiven will be will stand there, and the scales will tip against you as all your sins are piled up, as the sins are read out of that book of, of judgment that's talked about in Revelation chapter 20, and they'll be sent to hell for all the sins that you've ever committed. But again, if you believe on Jesus Christ, put your faith and trust in him alone, your sins are forgiven you're, you're, are, as to, and taken from you as far as the east is from the west. Yeah. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ today. Put all your faith in him. Call upon the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And then he says this, and then commanded Belshazzar and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And in that night, was Belshazzar, the king of Chalde the Chaldean, slain. And Darius, the Median, took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. Judgment doesn't come when we expect it. You know, he had had plenty of chances. But Belshazzar saw the handwriting on the wall. And his time was done. His, the number, his days were numbered, and it was time for the woe to come. Babylon was weighed in the balances and found wanting or lacking. It was over. The ba great Babylon was conquered by the Medes and the Persians. Let me just leave you with this thought as we head out this morning. We, as we talk about root sins that lead into other sins, and of course this first sin of uh, stealing, and then the other sins as well. The Bible says this in Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Amen. Do you hate evil this morning? Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. We need to be careful that we don't fall for these root sins, whether it's a lack of faith, whether it is, uh, you know, drinking alcohol, whether it's pride, thinking more highly than we ought to think of ourselves. We need to be careful with these because they lead 
to other sins and ultimately destruction and judgment. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you please bless us as we go. We thank you for your word and the warnings that it gives. These warnings are not uh, something that um, are grievous to us. The commandments of God are not grievous, Lord, but we're, we're thankful that it brings and produces, Lord, the fruits of the Spirit and the things that people want in their life, but they just don't want to do what you've told them to do to get it. And Lord, so I just pray that you would please bless our church, bless us personally, Lord. And I just thank you for these words.